Next, we come to the discussion of tuberous sclerosis. Tuberous sclerosis is also called as Bourneville disease. The prevalence of the disease varies between 1 in 6,000 to 1 in 10,000 live births. So, it is relatively more frequent compared to NF2, but slightly less frequent than as compared to NF1. It also shows autosomal dominant inheritance and there are two genes which are responsible for producing the same disease that is tuberous sclerosis. First is gene TSC1 which is present on long arm of chromosome 9. It codes for protein called as hematin. And second is TSC2 gene which is present on short arm of chromosome 16 which codes for protein called as tuberin. Both hematin and tuberin are considered to be tumor suppressor proteins. They are, these genes are tumor suppressor genes and these proteins are tumor suppressor in nature. Normally, they keep the mTOR pathway in regulation. There is a mTOR pathway. This pathway is kept in check by these proteins. Whenever there will be deficiency of either hematin or tuberin, you will have mTOR pathway becoming dysregulated producing the manifestations. mTOR pathway is involved in cellular growth, cell differentiation as well as neuronal plasticity and so you will have cis forming, benign tumors forming and CNS involvement as the hallmark of the disease. Within a cell, hematin and tuberin they combine to form a complex along with a third protein called as TBC1, TBC1D7 and together these they produce their effects on regulation of the pathway. So, a mutation in either TSC1 or TSC2 gene results in a similar disease in the patients. However, what we find is that those who are having TSC2 mutation tend to have a more severe disease than TSC1. So, this is one point that you need to remember can be asked in your exam. So, what exactly happens? So, these uh, hematin and tuberin do not directly affect the mTOR pathway. You need to understand that there is a pathway as I just told you called as mTOR pathway. This mTOR pathway is involved in multiple things. It regulates cell growth in the human beings. It is involved in regulation of cell size and it also controls neuronal differentiation and plasticity. What different kind of uh, neuronal differentiation will happen. Whenever there is this mTOR pathway is in turn regulated by a protein called as REB. A REB protein is a type of, it is a type of, a REB basically stands for RAS homologue enriched in brain. This REB protein is a type of cytoplasmic GTPs and this REP protein has a positive influence on the mTOR pathway. This REP protein is kept in check by the two proteins that is hematin and tuberin. So, the hematin tuberin complex is involved in keeping this pathway in check, right? Whenever there will be absence of hematin or tuberin, REP pathway will undergo exponential increase and so there will be excessive accumulation, excessive activation of the mTOR pathway which will result in the disease manifestations what we call as tuberous sclerosis. So, this is the genetic basis, the pathogenetic basis that you need to remember. Now, what are the clinical features of tuberous sclerosis? CNS involvement is the first thing. CNS involvement is considered to be according to Nelson as the hallmark of tuberous sclerosis. CNS features the lesions in CNS can broadly be divided into three parts. The first type of CNS lesion is called as cortical tubers. What is a tuber? Tuber is a type of potato or tuber, you know, uh, potato-like lesion, but in not all of them are fleshy lesions. Cortical tubers refer to a type of hematomatous lesion. So, they are a type of hematomas which occur in the brain tissue. They are scattered all through the brain. They can occur any part of the cortex. And these cortical tubers keep on appearing and di disappearing with time. The second type of lesion that we find in these patients are called as subependymal lesions. These subependymal lesions are usually in the form of subependymal focal lesions like cysts, sometimes subependymal nodules may be 
visible in some of these individuals. So, we call them as subependymal lesions or nodules. What is the ependyma? Ependyma is the lining of the ventricles and subependymal will mean just below that. So, subependymal lesions are mostly present near the lateral ventricles. Although they can occur in third and fourth ventricle region also, but mostly near later ventricles is their common site. By themselves, the subependymal nodules will not cause any problem. Either they will regress or undergo calcification. When they calcify, they produce an appearance called as candle dripping appearance. There is a theory that some of these calcified lesions may be responsible for late onset epilepsy in some of the individuals, although this theory has not been proven. The second, you know, outcome of the subependymal lesion is the development of local invasive aggressive tumor, what are called as SEGAs. About 15 to 20 percent of them may turn into SEGAs. What is SEGA? SEGA stands for subependymal. giant cell astrocytomas, subependymal giant cell astrocytomas, these SEGAs are locally invasive and they tend to produce hydrocephalus in the patient. So, if I have to show you diagram, a picture, an imaging picture, these are the various cortical tubers scattered through the brain which have been labeled here and this is a SEGA. As you can see, it is present in the lateral ventricle region. It grows locally and tends to produce obstructive hydrocephalus. It does not disseminate, it is not frankly malignant, but a locally invasive tumor. So, uh, these are the clinical lesions that you find in brain. What are the clinical manifestations? Next, we come to the neurological manifestations of tuberous sclerosis. We have talked about the lesions, right? What are the features, the CNS features that you find? Now, you need to understand that some of it, this disease, tuberous sclerosis, is a very heterogeneous disease. Same members of the same family having similar genetic mutation may, be, may behave totally differently. Some of them may be bright in studies, some of them will be having an average IQ and others will have severe CNS disability along with seizure involvement. Despite there being evidence of radiological involvement, the radiological and cognitive correlation is not very accurate in patients of tuberous sclerosis. So, neurological manifestations, you need to remember that some of them are asymptomatic. They may become symptomatic later in life, in, but young in the age, young in the life, the CNS features may be asymptomatic involving related to the CNS manifestations. If they manifest, what are the manifestations? They can broadly be divided into two parts. First is the development of epilepsy or seizure involvement. And second is the group of problems what we call as TAND. TAND stands for tuberous sclerosis associated neurological neuropsychiatric dysfunction. Some organizations instead of dysfunction they label it as disability. So, TAND is a broad spectrum of disorder just like epilepsy. So, what are the types of epilepsies which can happen in these individuals? Early in life, they tend to develop infantile spasms. So, infantile spasm just like you see in West syndrome, they will tend to develop. Infantile spasm, they may be associated with hip arrhythmia. Nelson says that some of the infantile spasm, there is no hip arrhythmia. So, both varieties of infantile spasm have been known to occur. It is an atypical type of infantile spasm which tend to develop. Then uh, later in life, that infantile spasms, they tend to reduce in number, but they are replaced by either focal clonic seizures or frankly generalized myoclonic epilepsies may develop in some of these individuals. When you talk about the tanned features, it will, the type of features which may be seen, they include 50 percent cases tend to develop autistic spectrum disorder, autistic spectrum disorder. About 40 percent of them will have intellectual disability in the form of low IQ. Whereas, others may develop features like ADHD, there may be specific learning disabilities and some of these patients may even have 
depression as one of the features. So these are the CNS manifestations that you find in patients of tuberous sclerosis. Second, we come to the clinical features pertaining to skin involvement. So skin involvement, the three classic features I have already shown in the adjacent pictures. The first skin involvement feature, the first characteristic feature which is present in almost 90% patients is hypomelanotic macules, what you call as ash leaf macules. Macule means not palpable, leaf means it has a irregular side border sometimes and ash means light whitish in color, grayish in color. So ash leaf macules refer to hypopigmented macules which tend to occur, macular lesions which tend to occur on the body, they are often present on the trunk and to be called as one of the criteria, at least three or more of these hypopigmented macules should be present on the body, discrete macules should be present. These ash leaf macules are best seen by Wood's ultraviolet lamp. So as you can see in this picture, this child is having one, two, three and four. Four lesions are already present. So these are the ash leaf macules which will suggest the presence of tuberous sclerosis as one possibility. The second type of skin lesion that we find in the so first skin lesion is ash leaf or hypopigmented macules. Second is development of these uh, you know acne like lesion what we call as adenoma sebaceum. These adenoma sebaceum they are acne like lesions. They are a kind of benign tumors which occur on the face, particularly in the nasal bridge and the cheek area. They tend to appear between quite early in life, that is they appear around 3 to 4 years of life and increase in size and number as age progresses. Beyond adolescent period, it is found that some of them coalesce and form fleshy lesions rather than being discrete. Adenoma sebaceum are usually absent at birth. And the third type of skin lesion that we find is this lesion as you can see on the side. This is called as a shagreen patch. What is a shagreen patch? Shagreen patch is a raised, rough, scaly lesion which is present in the lumbosacral region. So in the lumbosacral region, you will find a raised, rough, scaly lesion. According to Nelson, it has a orange peel consistency. So these are the three classical features of dermatological manifestation that you find in tuberous sclerosis. Then you may find other skin lesions which may include forehead fibrous plaques. These fibrous plaques are usually unilateral, raised, either yellow brown or flesh colored in nature and they are variable in consistency ranging from either very soft to hard in consistency. And then you have periangual fibromas. Fibromas may form around the nail bed or along the edges of the nail. They may sometimes cause nail destruction or nail hematomas. So uh, they are seen in about 15 to 20 percent patients of tuberous sclerosis and they appear in adolescence or later in life. So young children you will not find periangual fibromas. So this is a typical example of how a periangual fibroma will look like. About other organ systems, other than skin and CNS involvement, you may have development of cardiac lesions. The cardiac lesions are in the form of a lesion called as cardiac rhabdomyomas. Cardiac rhabdomyomas in tuberous sclerosis are seen in about 50% cases of tuberous sclerosis. These rhabdomyomas, they appear in the ventricular wall. Commonly, they occur in the ventricular myocardial wall and they are frequently on the left side, although right-sided rhabdomyomas have also been described. These rhabdomyomas may be asymptomatic or they may cause CCF or they may cause arrhythmias and they tend to regress spontaneously as age advances. So then first you have cardiac involvement, then you have renal involvement. Renal involvement is in the form of two lesions. First are the angiomyolipomas. 
renal angiomyolipomas are very frequent ranging from 75 to 80 percent patients of tuberous sclerosis. These renal angiomyolipomas usually increase in size and they come to attention only in the second decade of life onwards and they become symptomatic around third decade of life. What are the manifestations? Once they become symptomatic, they tend to develop, these patients tend to develop lumbar pain and hematuria. Very rarely life-threatening massive sub retroperitoneal hematomas can develop in some of these individuals. The second form are the benign renal cysts which can develop in these patients and they can be unilateral or bilateral. Both angiomyelopomas and renal cysts can be unilateral or bilateral. And then we have development of pulmonary lesions. The classic pulmonary lesion is called as pulmonary or lung lymphangioleomyomatosis. These are a type of uh, fleshy lymphatic containing, lymphatic element containing benign tumors which are very frequent in adolescent females. So, usually adolescent females are affected, males are very rarely affected. So, adolescent females on follow-up need to be looked out for lymphangioleomyomatosis as well. So, these are some of the other common lesions you will find in patients of tuberous sclerosis. Extra edge point, there are some retinal lesions also which have been described. The first retinal lesion is hematomas. These can produce a lesion called as mulberry lesion or plaque-like lesion. And secondly, there can be simply white deep pigmented patches similar to hypopigmented skin lesion. They are also called as uh, retinal achromic patch, right? So, two types of retinal lesions are, are described in tuberous sclerosis. Now, what is the diagnostic criteria? The diagnostic criteria says either two major or one major plus two minor criteria is diagnostic of tuberous sclerosis. It is called as definite tuberous sclerosis. So, what are the major features, major criteria? They include cortical dysplasias which include cortical tubers and cerebral white matter migration lines. It includes subependymal nodules. It includes SEGAs, facial angiofibromas, three or more or forehead plaque, ungual fibromas or periungual fibromas, two or more, hypomelanotic macules, that is ash leaf macules, which should be three or more and the size should be five millimeters in diameter or more, shagreen patch, multiple retinal nodular hematomas, cardiac rhabdomyomas, renal angiomyolipomas and pulmonary lymphangioleomyomatosis. So, these are considered to be the major features of tuberous sclerosis. There are also some minor features which are not that numerous. So, you have dental enamel pits more than three, intraoral fibromas two or more, retinal achromic patch, confetti skin lesions and non-renal hematomas. These are the minor features of tuberous sclerosis along with multiple renal cysts. Remember that renal angiomyolipoma is a major condition, major criteria, whereas renal cyst is considered to be a minor criteria. Now, coming to the management of tuberous sclerosis. Management is usually symptomatic. Management of SEGA, whenever SEGA develops, if there are cortical tubers, they are not interfering, you need not do anything specific. If there is a SEGA which is developing and it becomes symptomatic. See, uh, most of the SEGAs will come to attention once they produce symptoms. But if a patient is being followed up by MRI every 1 to 3 years, you may pick up SEGAs before they become symptomatic also. SEGAs, if they are producing obstructive hydrocephalus, first is you need to perform VP shunt in the patient, followed by definite surgical resection of SEGA. If surgical resection is not possible, if surgery is not possible or you pick up SEGA on screening, that is it is an asymptomatic patient. In these patients, you can use a therapy called as mTOR inhibitor therapy. The mTOR inhibitor which is approved for use in these patients is called as Averolimus. Averolimus is FDA approved for surgically non-resectable or recurring tumor or asymptomatic tumor where you don't want to do surgery related to SEGA. Then we have management of infantile spasms in tuberous sclerosis. You know that tuberous sclerosis, uh, uh, you know that infantile spasm, the drug of choice is ACTH followed by Vigabatrin. But in patients of tuberous sclerosis, the first line therapy for infantile spasm is usually Vigabatrin. 
The problem with Vega Baterin is it causes visual field defects. So annual ophthalmic examination is bare minimum needed. These days the trend is towards more frequent three to six monthly examination for uh, visual field testing. If it fails, then the second line investigation, uh, the second line therapy that we can always use is ACTH. And for other types of epilepsies, you need to consider other the usual anti-epileptic agents. Many of these patients, uh, sometimes if there are refractory seizures, you may need to give Avrolimus therapy as adjunct. And if still there is no response, you can consider epilepsy surgery may also be needed in some of these patients if in case you are able to find a focal lesion responsible for the epilepsy in these patients. Now, what is the management of renal angiomyolipomas? According to Nelson, embolization followed by corticosteroids is the first line therapy if the patient presents with acute hemorrhage, right? Why do you add steroid? To alleviate, to prevent post embolization syndrome. Nephrectomy should be avoided. Why? Because the lesions are diffuse and bilateral. So even if you remove one kidney, the other kidney may still have lesion which will become symptomatic few days later. Uh, for asymptomatic angiomyolipomas, particularly if the size is more than 3 cm, Avrolimus is indicated and selective embolization can be done or kidney sparing resection is an alternative therapy for asymptomatic angiomyolipomas. In patient of pulmonary lymphangiomyomatosis, you can use uh, another mTOR inhibitor called as repamycin or serolimus can be used. Avrolimus is, although some of the studies have used it, but uh, preferably repamycin or serolimus is useful in this category of patients. And for skin lesions, usually hypomelanotic patches do not require any therapy. In case you do want to, to use it, topical repamycin can be used for these lesions. Now, coming to the follow-up in tubular sclerosis, uh, brain MRI will be needed every 1 to 3 years. Renal imaging will be needed using ultrasound CT or MRI every 1 to 3 years. Echocardiogram every 1 to 3 years in patients with cardiac rhabdomyomas. And ECG will be needed every 3 to 5 years. HRCT chest CT will be needed every 5 to 10 years in females older than 18 years. Why only females? Because only females tend to develop pulmonary lymphangiomyomatosis. And they are relatively slow growing, so you need not do it yearly. And obviously, CT, hai, toh, there will be radiation problems. So, 5 to 10 yearly CT is recommended. And dental examination will be needed twice a year. Dental pets, enamel changes and all those things can be problematic. Although they are rare, but younger children, will you will need to do dental examination. Uh, skin examination will be needed once a year. Detailed ophthalmic examination once a year will be needed in patients with vision concerns or with retinal lesions. And regular early ophthalmic examination will be needed in the case the child is receiving Vega better and I have already told you. And... Uh, Neurodevelopmental testing will be needed at the time of beginning first grade when the child goes to school and screening for TAND will be needed at each clinical visit. So this is related to tubular sclerosis. So in this part one module of neurocutaneous syndromes, I have talked about the general approach, the general things, the names of the diseases and I have talked about NF1, NF2 in details, their variants and tubular sclerosis in full details. In part two of neurocutaneous syndrome, I will be taking up the remaining lesions along with some of the key points and one liners that you need to remember subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from prep ladder